This episode of Legal Eagle was made possible by Skillshare. Learn to think like a lawyer for free for two months by clicking on the link in the description. Usually claiming this is a constitutional crisis in this administration is just hyperbole, but something was different when the administration attempted to include a citizenship question in the American census. The Supreme Court has already answered that query with a big fat no, that 2020 census cannot include the citizenship question on the census. And the government's lawyers told the lawyer courts that they were prepared to comply with the Supreme Court's order until President Trump tweeted that actually, as leader of the US government, he might just use that question anyway. And behold, we have what might be considered a constitutional crisis on our hands. Can a president defy or ignore a Supreme Court order? Has this ever happened before? And are we out of the woods when it comes to a constitutional crisis? That's what we're gonna talk about today on this Real Law Review. Hey, Legal Eagles, it's time to think like a lawyer. Since the day President Donald Trump took the oath of office, people have been predicting a constitutional crisis. The Constitution doesn't define anything like a constitutional crisis. It's basically just a term that we come up with when we have to suggest lots of danger when it comes to the interplay between uh, different branches of the US government. But a constitutional crisis over whether one branch of the US government would acknowledge the full authority of another is a kind of a big deal in its own right. And that's pretty much where we are today. It appears that we may be safe for the moment, but it's worth doing a full retrospective on the census controversy because things keep getting weirder and we're not out of the woods yet. So how did we get here? First, a primer on the American census. The census requires the government to count the population of the United States every 10 years. Counting the population includes all people, whether citizens or non-citizens. The census is mandated by the Constitution in Article 1, which governs Congress's power. The Constitution requires the census every 10 years. Congress delegates that power to the executive branch, but it is a constitutionally mandated congressional power. The question of who to include in the census goes back to the founding of this country and the infamous Three-Fifths Compromise. At the time, the Southern states, which had huge populations of slaves, uh, wanted to count those it, when it came to congressional representation, while the Northern states felt that that was unfair because all of these slaves were not considered US citizens. So for better or worse, the states reached the infamous Three-Fifths Compromise. The census the census is used to allocate federal funds, draw legislative districts, and reapportion congressional seats. Although the census once included a citizenship question, the Census Bureau dropped the question in the 1950s because it caused an undercount of the actual population. According to Census Bureau experts, the citizenship question scares people who live in households that include non-citizens. Census responses are supposed to remain confidential and cannot be given to any other federal agencies to assist deportations. But many people simply don't know or believe that their answers will be kept confidential, and including the question can be particularly intimidating to uh, immigrants. Some studies have shown that including the citizenship question reduces the actual response rate among households with at least one non-citizen by as much as eight percentage points, and that is a pretty big deal. The ultimate goal of including the citizenship question, as explained by Republican strategist Thomas Hoffler, is to allow Republicans to create heavily gerrymandered maps where likely Democratic voters are stuffed into geographically small urban districts. Although Hoffler passed away, his correspondence indicated that he wanted to use citizen population instead of total population to draw legislative districts, which in his words, quote, would be advantageous to Republicans and non-Hispanic whites and would dilute the political power of Hispanics. According to the New York Times, Hoffler wrote to Trump and other Republicans even before the president was inaugurated urging the Trump administration to include the census question and obfuscate the reason for including it, claiming that it was necessary to enforce the Voting Rights Act. Once President Trump was inaugurated, he followed Hoffler's blueprint and despite arguing in court that the question was meant to enforce minority voting rights, in public, Trump admitted that that was not in fact correct. The real reason? Well, President Trump stated, In other words, you need it to do precisely what Hoffler said, to create an undercount that would help Republicans and hurt Democrats. Several states sued the federal government after the Trump administration announced it would use the census to ask people if they were US citizens. As those cases wound their way through the federal court system, the Trump administration didn't do a particularly good job of coming up with a facially neutral reason for including the question. And in fact, although Hoffler died a few years ago, his daughter discovered documents on his hard drive that showed the citizenship 
citizenship question was designed for the purpose of giving white voters more power. While it's not 100% clear, it is entirely possible that the Supreme Court used that evidence to determine that the Trump administration's reasoning for including the question was in fact pretextual. So the Supreme Court said that Trump and Labor Secretary Ross could not put the question on the 2020 census. And in fact, I covered that case in the Roundup of Supreme Court cases from this term, link below. Now, during the litigation, the government had repeatedly told the courts that they needed to print census forms no later than June 30th. That rationale allowed them to skip the intermediate appeals court entirely and go straight to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court's decision happened shortly before that deadline. So when the Supreme Court remanded the case back down to the lower federal courts, the Department of Justice attorneys responsible for arguing the government's position told the courts, that the cases were basically over and that the government would print the census by June 30th as scheduled without question. Now, normally that would be the end of this particular story, at least until the next census in 10 years. But President Trump had other ideas. Quote, so important for our country that the very simple and basic, are you a citizen of the United States question be allowed to be asked in the 2020 census. Department of Commerce and Department of Justice are working very hard on this, even on the 4th of July. DOJ lawyers were caught flat footed by this tweet. And in fact, federal court judge George Hazel, who is presiding over one of the two census questions in the US district for Maryland, said that he followed Trump on Twitter and hauled all of the lawyers, both the plaintiffs and the DOJ defense lawyers into his court for an emergency conference with all of the attorneys. In the court conference, Judge Hazel said that he follows President Trump on Twitter and that the tweet quote, directly contradicted the position that the DOJ had taken 48 hours earlier. The transcript of this particular conference is pretty remarkable, even for a layperson. I would never want to be on the receiving end of the vitriol that Judge Hazel issued towards the DOJ lawyers. And believe me, contradicting something that you have promised to a judge is definitely not a position that any lawyer ever wants to take. But DOJ lawyer Joshua Gardner had to tell the federal court judge the tweet this morning was the first I had heard of the president's position on this issue. In other words, Gardner had no idea what his boss was going to do or say with the government's new position. Later that same day, the lawyers had the unenviable task of telling judges in all of the pending cases that all the stuff they had said earlier about printing the forms on July 30th and obeying the Supreme Court, well, they were basically trying to take that back. So. Could President Trump really defy an order from the Supreme Court? Well, the framers of the Constitution believe strongly in checks and balances, building a system of governance where the three branches of government constantly had the ability to stop each other from gaining too much power. And in the famous 1803 case, Marbury versus Madison, the Supreme Court established a legal doctrine known as judicial review, which is the ability of the court to declare legislative or executive acts in violation of the Constitution. Now, judicial review was controversial at the time, since it's not explicitly found in the Constitution. However, it has basically been the law of the land ever since 1803. At the time, Alexander Hamilton wrote that, quote, the courts were designed to be an intermediate body between the people and the legislature in order, among other things, to keep the latter within the limits assigned to their authority. James Madison once said that an independent judicial system provided, quote, an impenetrable bulwark against every assumption of power in the legislative or executive. And so as time went on, the Supreme Court got the final say over whether a law was constitutional or not. But there's actually nothing that can force the president to follow the orders of the Supreme Court. The court system doesn't have an army. It really doesn't have any police officers except for a few marshals who basically are just there for the protection of the judges. Judicial review is one of the strongest norms in the American government, but presidents have ignored Supreme Court decisions before. Let's start with the first real example of a president defying the Supreme Court, Andrew Jackson and the Cherokees. Ever since the Revolutionary War, the United States had openly desired to take take Cherokee and Creek land in what is now the American South. And Georgia had claimed over 100 million acres of Cherokee land as its own. The federal government originally backed the tribes and signed treaties guaranteeing that they would never have to move. Treaties that the government would finally break when President Andrew Jackson came along and signed the Indian Removal Act, which aimed to force Cherokees off of their land. The Cherokee government argued that they had the same rights as any sovereign nation and therefore passed a law restricting white Europeans from residing on Cherokee land. The ensuing court case wound up before the Supreme Court, which ruled for the Cherokee Nation. Chief
Chief Justice John Marshall wrote that the Cherokee had sovereignty, which included the same rights of possession as any other nation over its own land. The court reasoned that the tribe could exclude people from buying its land or residing there. President Jackson, however, had very different ideas. President Jackson supposedly said, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. Georgia decided to simply ignore the Supreme Court's order and President Jackson proceeded to let Georgia do what it wanted. And that is how the Cherokee ended up leaving Georgia for Oklahoma on a journey that is known as the Trail of Tears. By refusing to do anything to enforce the Supreme Court's decision, President Jackson was daring the court to intervene, knowing that the court's enforcement mechanisms were shaky at best. And at times in the past, the court had ordered federal marshals to enforce orders, but there isn't really any constitutional authority uh, allowing for this. The US Marshals work for the Attorney General. The Attorney General is part of the executive branch, so the Supreme Court couldn't send in the marshals even if they wanted to. In a different case, one of the biggest stains on Abraham Lincoln's presidency was when he suspended the writ of habeas corpus during the Civil War. A writ of habeas corpus is a legal term that means that every person in prison has a right to petition the courts for his or, or her release. Habeas corpus is actually a right that is enumerated in the Constitution. But Lincoln suspended habeas corpus rights early in the Civil War, preferring to hold prisoners without any mechanism for their release. The Supreme Court held that what Lincoln did was in fact unconstitutional. But President Lincoln ignored the order because he was more worried about the war itself. And again, there was nothing that the Supreme Court could do because its orders are not self-executing. This means that the court doesn't have any ability to enforce its own orders. In reality, the Supreme Court and other federal courts have to depend on the executive branch to enforce their orders, since the executive is responsible for enforcing the laws. And the vast majority of presidents have viewed it as their constitutional duty to obey Supreme Court rulings and even enforce them. When the Supreme Court held that states could not maintain an education system that was separate but equal, the governor of Arkansas resisted racial integration. But at that time, President Dwight Eisenhower Eisenhower used his authority to call on the military to enforce the Supreme Court's integration order. President Eisenhower said, whenever normal agencies prove inadequate to the task, it becomes necessary for the executive branch of the federal government to use its powers and authority to uphold federal courts. The president's responsibility is inescapable. In accordance with that responsibility, I have today issued an executive order directing the use of troops under federal authority to aid in the execution of federal law at Little Rock, Arkansas. The National Guard went to Little Rock to help make sure that the Little Rock Nine, as they were known, were allowed to go to school enforcing Brown versus Board of Education. Most of the time, presidents will sharply criticize Supreme Court decisions, but they will still follow the court's orders. This was the case in 2004, when the Supreme Court struck down President George W. Bush's plan to have prisoners held in Guantanamo Bay tried by military tribunals rather than the court system. Similarly, in 2010, President Obama sharply criticized the Citizens United case, but still President Obama did not decline to follow the opinion as laid out by the Supreme Court, nor did he issue an executive order imposing a new campaign finance system unilaterally. It's common for politicians to have an opinion about whether cases are wrongly decided or not, but it is not normal in modern times for presidents to ignore Supreme Court orders. Which brings us to the current administration. Did the founders leave us totally and completely unable to defend ourselves against a president who won't obey a court order? Well, the founders of America created three co-equal branches of government and gave the legislative branch the duty to impeach a president who commits both, quote, high crimes and misdemeanors. Now, defining high crimes and misdemeanors is beyond the scope of this video, but there are plenty of constitutional scholars who believe that it is Congress's duty to impeach a president who refuses to follow the law or refuses to follow Supreme Court precedent. Now, President Trump tends to tweet about a lot of things that make him angry and often fails to follow through with some of the things that he states via Twitter. And it's possible that the census tweets from the president are just another example of saying one thing and doing another. But here, President Trump first took to Twitter to trash the Supreme Court's ruling and then said he would consider using an executive order to add the census question by fiat, ignoring the Supreme Court. He said, We're thinking about doing that as one of the ways. We have four or five ways we can do it. It's one of the ways that we're thinking about doing it very seriously. President Trump followed up his comments with tweets announcing that he would make another announcement about the census question during a right-wing social media gathering at the White House. Quote, the White House will be hosting a very big and very important social media summit today. Would I have become president without social media? Yes, probably. At its conclusion, we will all go to the beautiful Rose Garden for a news conference on the census and citizenship. 
However, after days of criticism during the news conference, President Trump backed down with AG Barr stating that the administration would not be adding a census question after all. Attorney General Barr offered his interpretation of the Supreme Court's decision and the legality of the citizenship question and said that the administration never considered adding that question at all. At the end of the news conference, uh, Attorney General Barr accused the media of being hysterical by stating that Trump would use an executive order to usurp the Supreme Court when the administration had never ever considered doing that. Some in the media have been suggesting in the hysterical mode of the day that the administration has been planning to add the citizenship question to the census by executive fiat without regard to contrary court orders or what the Supreme Court might say. This has been based on rank speculation and nothing more. As should be obvious, there has never been under, this has never been under consideration. I don't really know how to square this statement with reality. The president said exactly the opposite of this and the news media was relying on the tweets and actual verbal statements that the president made, including a question and answer from a reporter to President Trump. The reporter asked, are you going to issue an executive order on the census? To which President Trump replied, we're thinking about doing that. It's one of the ways we have four or five ways we can do it. It's one of the ways we're thinking about doing it very seriously. We're doing well on the census. So according to the president himself, of course the citizenship question was under consideration. It's hard to criticize the news media for being hysterical when they're simply reporting what President Trump himself said. Now, one of the consequences of Barr and Trump's reversals is that the DOJ lawyers were thrown under the bus in front of the federal courts. Rather than continue litigating this case, all of the DOJ lawyers asked to be withdrawn from the case, both in the Maryland case and in the New York case, which is uh, basically an unprecedented move. It really uh, harkens back to the Saturday Night Massacre under Nixon. The Department of Justice would not say why those lawyers asked to be withdrawn from the case, but it's safe to say that some of them refused to go back into court and uh, contradict their prior statements to the judges and to potentially defy the Supreme Court's precedent. The two federal judges who were overseeing the various census cases were not amused by this attempt to withdraw. Judge Furman of the US District Court for the Southern District of New York would not allow any of the lawyers to withdraw in the middle of the case and stated that the government's reasoning to withdraw from the case were patently deficient. Judge Furman also said that the government itself was responsible for making the case a time-sensitive emergency. Quote, as this court observed many months ago, this case has been litigated on the premise based in no small part on defendant's own insistence that a speedy resolution of plaintiff's claims is a matter of great private and public importance. This all goes back to the government's insistence that the case needed to be wrapped up by June 30th and that deadline had expired. In the end, Judge Furman denied the motion to withdraw for nine of the 11 lawyers. The two who were granted leave had apparently quit the Department of Justice prior to that decision. Judge Hazel in the Maryland District Federal Court followed suit by refusing to allow the government lawyers to withdraw. Judge Hazel, who's the one that conducted the emergency court conference, said that a change in counsel did not give the government a do-over and that even if it added new lawyers, the government would still have to answer for the statements it made before. Quote, a change in counsel does not create a clean slate for a party to proceed as if prior representations made to the court were not in fact made. A new DOJ team will need to be prepared to address these and other previous representations made by the withdrawing attorneys at the appropriate juncture. For the time being, it looks like the administration is indeed backing down and respecting the Supreme Court decision. However, the House has voted to hold Attorney General Barr and Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross in contempt of Congress for their refusal to turn over key documents that relate to the Trump administration's attempt to add the citizenship question to the 2020 census. So this in fact may just be the beginning of another potential constitutional crisis and dispute. Now, it's unlikely that Attorney General Barr fooled anyone about what the president said or what the administration was trying to do. He really could have benefited from Sabah Tahir's Skillshare class writing authentic fiction, how to build a believable character. Sabah walks you through her personal process for crafting authentic and believable characters. It's packed with exercises, prompts, and tried and true techniques 
that teach you how to create real and nuanced characters that feel like they could walk right off the page. After taking that Skillshare class, you might actually be able to convince people that your character is telling the truth. Skillshare is an online learning community that has over 30,000 classes on everything like lifestyle, design, and technology. Legal Eagles will get two free months of Skillshare when you click on the link below. Plus, it really helps out this channel. The free premium membership gives you unlimited access to must-know topics so you can improve your skills and learn new things, all free for two months. So click on the link below to get two free months of Skillshare and start learning to think like a lawyer today. Do you agree? Do you think the citizenship question should be on the census? Do you think the administration will be able to come up with another justification that passes muster? Leave your objections in the comments and check out my other real law reviews over here where I will see you in court.